What's good everybody, it's your boy Vaughn back again and today who I'm going to be talking about in this documentary style video is the queen of funk herself, Betty Davis. Now if you're new to the channel, make sure you hit the like button, subscribe, share, comment, all that good stuff and let's get into it. Now Betty Davis, better, better formerly known as Betty Gray, was born in Durham, North Carolina on July 26, 1944. She developed an interest in music when she was about 10 years old and was introduced to various blues musicians by a grandmother while staying on a, at her farm in Reedsville. At 12 years old, she wrote one of her very first songs, I'm Going to Bake That Cake of Love. The family then relocated to Homestead, Pennsylvania, so her father, Henry, could work at Pennsylvania's steel mill. Davis attended and graduated Homestead High School and that is where she decided to pursue a, sh a career in show business after watching her father dance just like Elvis Presley. Now, I can guess this is around the 50s when Elvis Presley started getting very popular amongst not only white America, but black America as well. When Betty was, se not 17, when Betty was 16 years old, she left Homestead from New York City, enrolling at the Fashion Institute of Technology while living with her aunt. She soaked up a lot of the Greenwich Village culture and folk music of the early 1960s. She associated herself a lot with the people that was frequently roaming around the uptown hip club of the time called The Cellar. And that was a place where a lot of young established people of that time congregated. It was multiracial, crowds of a lot of models, design students, actors, and singers, everybody you could think of was congregated at that spot. And at the cellar is where she played a lot of records and chatted with a lot of people. She was a friend and early muse to fashion designer Stephen Burroughs, or Stephen Burroughs. I, I don't know if I'm saying that correctly. He, uh, who also studied at the same institution she studied at at the same time. She worked as a model, appearing in a lot of photo spreads, which were 17, Ebony and Glamour. While in New York City, she met a lot of musicians that who were just coming up or who were already kind of well known. And one of those few musicians that she would meet would be Jimi Hendrix and Sly Stone of Sly and the Family Stone. And this would literally spark her early seeds of her musical career when she had a friendship with soul singer Lou Courtney who obviously produced her first single called The Cellar, which was named after the infamous club. Though the existence of that record has been questioned, she still managed to secure a contract with Don Costa, or Don Costa, I think, Don Costa, I believe, who had written arrangements for Frank Sinatra. As Betty Gray, she recorded Get Ready for Betty, and also I'm Gonna Get My Baby Back in 1964 for Costa's international label. Around that same time, she recorded a single called I'll Be There with Roy Arlington for Sapphire's Records under the joint name Roy and Betty. Her first professional gig came after she wrote Uptown to Harlem for the Chamber Brothers. Their 1967 album was a major success, but Betty herself focused on her modeling career. She was basically saying that the music was more of a hobby to her at that time. She was successful as a model, but felt bored at the same time as, you know, things started to pile up. She said in her own words that, I didn't like modeling because you didn't need the brains to do it. It's only going to last as long as you look good. <laughs> and y'all see how Tyra Banks been looking good a couple of all these years, you know what I'm saying, you know what I'm saying? But <laughs> in 1968, when Betty, when Betty was in a relationship with Hugh Mas I don't know how to say his last name, but somebody help me in the comments. When she was in a relationship with Hugh, she recorded several songs for Columbia Records with her boyfriend at the time doing the arrangements. Two of, the, two of them released um, as a single, which was called Live, Love, Learn, and It's My Life. Her relationship with Miles Davis will begin to blossom 
around this time and which basically led to her breaking up with her previous boyfriend. She was also featured on the cover of Miles Davis's album that was coming out around that time, which included his tribute to her through a song. And around this time, Betty also introduced psychedelic rock in the flamboyant clothing styles of the 60s era, as Miles himself was still trying to figure out what was hip and what was not. In the spring of 1969, Betty returned back to Columbia's 52nd Street Studios to record a series of demo tracks with Miles and T.O. producing. At least five songs were taped during those sessions, three of which were Betty's originals, two of which were covers of Cream and Credence Clearwater Revival. Miles attempted to use a lot of these demo songs to secure an album deal for Betty, but neither Columbia nor Atlantic were interested, and they were archived until 2016 when they were officially released under the compilation, The Columbia Years. After the end of her marriage with Miles Davis, Betty moved to London probably around 1971 to pursue her modeling career. She wrote music a lot while she was staying in the UK, and after about a year, she returned back to the US with the intention of recording songs with Carlos Santana. Instead, she recorded her own group of songs with a group of West Coast funk musicians, including Larry Graham, Greg Rico, the Pointer Sisters, and members of Towers of Power, or Tower of Power, excuse me. Davis wrote and arranged a lot of her songs. You can kind of say she either picked up on it from, you know, being with her grandmother or she picked up a lot from a lot of the artists she met and worked with to just know how to rearrange and write all of her own songs. Her first record was Betty Davis, which was released in 1973. She released two more studio albums. One, They Say I'm Different, which was released in 1974 and her major label debut on Island Records, which was entitled Nasty Gal a year later in 1975. Now, let me back up to Escalade. They Say I'm Different is one of the most experimental albums I've heard from not only a female, but an artist in general. And for that time, for that album to come out, a lot of people overlooked the album because it wasn't like a success commercially. And I'm gonna get into the reason why it wasn't a success commercially. But as I listen to the album as a 19 year old, the album does really make me feel like I'm in the 70s and it makes and it still feels relevant too. some of the instrumentation feels relevant with what she was talking about. She was literally ahead of her time in what she was talking about at that time. And though her albums did flop, she had two more minor hits on the Billboard R&B chart, which was called If I'm in Luck, I Might Get Picked Up which reached number six, number 66 in 1973 and shut off the lights, which reached number 97 in 1975. Betty herself remained a cult figure as a singer, but unfortunately due to her sexual lyrics and her performance style, which were both controversial for the time, she really didn't have a lot of success in the US, but she had a lot of success in overseas, specifically in Europe. And you know, she was allowed to perform the way she wanted to perform, but here back home in the U.S., especially a black woman of that time pushing the sexual agenda, it, it wasn't going to work because they said she was too sexually aggressive, they, her lyrics were too much, and it's weird when you look at the lyrics of today, you're like, her lyrics weren't that sexual or that aggressive, but in their words, this was their words. Some of her shows were bo- even boycotting, like if, like, like she was like doing anything bad and her songs were not played on the radio and that kind of goes to why a lot of people don't know who betty davis is because her songs weren't commercially played by a lot of groups of people even religious groups and the naacp even spoke out about this they even didn't like her style of music which is kind of weird right and carlos santana recalled betty as being somebody that couldn't be tamed. And musically and physically, she was extreme and attractive, which I can agree on. She was very attractive. And it's unfortunate that she didn't get the shine that she should have deserved because the way she was fusing funk, R&B, soul, and rock together, she was ahead of her time. And the sexual acts that she was doing is nothing compared to how y'all see today. You know what I mean? But she did what she did. And which brings us to her retirement.
In 1976, Davis completed another album for Island Records, which was unfortunately shelved and unreleased for 33 years, before being dropped by the label. She spent a year in Japan spending time with Silent Monks. In 1980, Davis's father died, which prompted her to return back to the U.S. to live with her mother in Homestead, Pennsylvania. Betty struggled to overcome her father's death and subsequent mental illness. She acknowledged that she suffered a setback at the time, but stayed in Homestead, accepted the end of her career, and lived a quiet life. The tracks from Davis's final recording sessions in 1979 were released on two bootleg albums, Crashing from Passion and Hanging Out in Hollywood, which was released in 1996. A greatest hits album, Anti-Love, the, Betty, the Best of Betty Davis, was also released in 1995. In 2007, Betty Davis's They Say I'm Different were reissued by the Light in, in the Attic Records, excuse me, by Light in the Attic Records. By 2009, the label reissued Nasty Gal and her unreleased fourth studio album, which was recorded in 1976, retitled it, Is It Love or Desire? Both reissues contain extensive linear notes and shed some light on the mystery of why her fourth album considered possibly to be her best work by members of her last band. And unfortunately, it was shelved and remained unreleased for 33 years. By 2017, an independent documentary directed by Phil Cox entitled Betty, They Say I'm Different, which was the released, and it was released on Amazon Prime because that was my first time ever watching it. Um, I want to say I watched it last year before um, I went off to my freshman year of college. I watched it and I was blown away by the documentary. And what Phil said was that he, when he tracked down Davis, he found her living in the basement of a house with no internet, no cell phone, or even a car. He said this wasn't a woman with riches or luxury. She was living on the bare essentials. And honestly, while I was watching that documentary, they didn't really show an older version of Betty. They didn't show an older version. We heard her speak over the phone to her old band members about wanting to get back together with her and record some new music. But Betty kind of just you know, was like, nah, I'm good. I don't want to do it no more. And it, and it really kind of saddened me a little bit because you had a woman that was full of talent, met with all these musicians in her past, and she still didn't want to give it another go round. Like a lot of some of these other artists that are around her age, still touring, still performing. And it's unfortunate that America of that time wasn't acceptive of who Betty was or I feel like the industry wasn't ready for who Betty Davis really potentially was going to be. They didn't see the big picture because either a she had the look, she had the sex appeal. I think they just were over not even overshadowed, but they were blinded or they they were just too focused on her lyrics and her antics. And by 19 not by 19, by 2019 Davis released a Little Bit Hot Tonight, which was her first new song in over 40 years, which was performed and sung by Danielle Maggio. I don't know if I'm saying that correctly. I'm sorry if, I, if I'm not saying it correctly. I cannot speak today. And she was all, who also was a friend and associate producer on Betty, They Say I'm Different. And where it does lead, let me go back to this. Let me go back to why <laughs> she broke up with Miles Davis. I'm sorry, y'all. As a in 1966, Betty met fellow jazz musician Miles Davis, who was 19 years old around that time of her sen of her senior. He was separated from his first wife, dancer Frances Davis, and was dating actress Cicely Tyson at the time. Betty began dating Miles in early 1968, and they were married that September. During their year of marriage, she introduced him to the fashions and popular music trends of that era, which I stated earlier, that influenced his music. In his autobiography, Miles even credits Betty with helping to plant the seeds of his further musical explorations by introducing him to a lot of psychedelic rock, which later met him, le led to him meeting Jimi Hendrix and funk innovator Sly Stone. The album that I'm talking about that was released in 1968 he features Betty on the cover and includes a song named after her and his uh, and also in his autobiography Miles stated that Betty was too young and wild and accused her of even having an affair with Jimi Hendrix which ultimately was you know what led to them breaking up and ended their marriage Betty herself denied the affair stating I was so angry with Miles when he wrote that it was disrespectful to both me and Jimi 
Miles and I broke up because of his violent temper. Now, if you haven't seen the movie um, Miles Ahead, yeah, you can see my man Miles was on some, uh, he was, he was, he was on some ish, you know what I mean? He was on something. After accusing her of adultery, he filed for divorce in 1969. Miles even told Jet Magazine that the divorce was obtained on a temperament charge. He added, I'm just not that kind of cat to be married. Hendrix and Miles remained close as friends and planning to record more music together up until Hendrix's unfortunate death. The affluence of Hendrix and especially Sly Stone on Miles Davis was obviously on the album Bitches Brew, which was released in 1970, which ushered in a new era of jazz fusion. It has been said that he wanted to call the album originally Witches Brew, but Betty herself convinced him to change it to Bitches Brew. And you see, Be Betty saw the future, man. She saw the future. And Betty Davis, after this, dated musician Eric Clapton, but she refused to collaborate with him. And I don't know more about, you know, any more information about that whole situation. But if anybody else do, make sure y'all drop the comments below. And in 1975, Davis, you know, had a lover named Robert Palmer, which helped her secure, secure another deal with Island Records. Shortly thereafter, she released her album, Nasty Gal. And which brings us brings us to the closing of this. Unfortunately, Davis died from cancer at her home in Homestead, Pennsylvania, on February 9th, 2022, at the age of 77 years old. Now, I'm gonna be honest with you. I remember last year seeing, I think, a report of her passing away, but I didn't know who she was. And you know, here's the crazy part: is like anybody I know doesn't know who Betty Davis is, but. After I discovered her last year, I played um, I played her song, They Say I'm Different, for one of my um, friends that I work with for music, and he literally enjoyed the song because he said that it's very different, the funk within it is so good, and the vibe of, that sh of the way she was singing was very different, and when you look back at um, Betty Davis's style, you can kind of say she ushered in a lot of experimental like vocally, especially with somebody like a Macy Gray, and you look at somebody like a Erica Badu or somebody like a, um, I, I was gonna say Flowetry as well because they were experimental within their music as well. So Betty Davis, in my opinion, paved the paved the way for a lot of females with not only just um, R and B for being you know sexual, but for a lot of uh, female hip hop artists too, without them even knowing. Went with you know the Megan Thee Stallions, the Lottos, the Glorillas of today, just being sexual on stage and talking how they want to talk in their lyrics and telling people like, hey, I'm who I am and you got to deal with it. I'm different and I want to be different. You can't tell me that I'm not different. But personally, in my opinion, Betty Davis, she's very underrated and is a legend in my book, a real queen of funk. And she deserves to be remembered and also talked about more than just remembered as somebody who was just a mysterious woman with no other short career. You know what I mean? I think she should be remembered more than what America wasn't ready for at that time. Had she came out today as a young artist, the way she came out back in the 70s, she would literally be a, a breath of fresh air for all the music, in my opinion. But everybody that enjoyed this video, I hope that y'all all try to take the time out your day to go look up her music or look more look up more about her. Check out the documentary on Amazon Prime. Betty Davis, they say I'm different. And if you're new to the channel, make sure you hit that like button, subscribe, share, comment, all that good stuff. And until then, y'all, your boy Von out. Peace.